Hello and welcome to the Business of Authority. I'm Jonathan Stark. And I'm Rochelle Moulton. And today we are going to talk about niching into specific versus small target markets. Yeah, I am so wanting to talk about specific versus small. And I, mm. you know, when we were talking about this in the green room, mm. I was questioning, like, how often do I say small when I mean specific? Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of, I mean, there, there's a relationship there. So it's understandable to talk about it in that way because niching down by definition is going to be a subset of the overall population. So it's going to be smaller than mm -hmm. businesses. Or we help businesses or we help people, right? That's everybody yeah. pretty much. We help people. <laughs> right. So it is very easy to to talk about it in terms of market size and saying like, you know, like Seth Godin, a minimum viable audience, you know, get, find 10 people that want to pick the best Airbnb in Paris and create a PDF for them. And if, if it's, if it's great, they'll share it and it grow. But you know, that, that story never talks about like what happens next, what happens if there's no demand in the market or there is no mm -hmm. market? Like it can be possible to pick a segment of the population that is not in the market for the things that you're capable of doing. Right. So like there needs to be all of these things, but the, the, I think I tweeted about the, I said something like, like a target, a niche target market might be small, but it's definitely specific. Right. Like it's much more important for it to be specific than it is to be small. I mean, it doesn't need to be small at all. It could be huge. As long as it's specific, then to me, that's what's going to produce Rolodex moments, which is what you want. Well, I think the other thing is to remember big picture. I always think about this as, as the Venn diagram where you have your talents, you have your passions and an existing market. And it's where those three come together. That's usually a sweet spot. Mm -hmm. And as long as you can pull all three of those into something that is specific, that's kind of a, a really good starting point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think we've talked about, we've talked about, recently talked about the numbers behind niching down and positioning. And so you can, you know, so dear listener, you can go back and look for titles on that subject. Um, but today we wanted to bring up some examples maybe and uh, got a sort of long list of possible ones, but the, the concept is the, the, the whole point about talking about it is that if you're, you know, just like anything to anyone, then you're nothing to nobody, right? It's like that you just don't right. come to mind when somebody says to somebody else that they're looking for someone to help with this particular problem. So the, the whole point of niching down is that it's a piece of your positioning that will make you or your product or your service or your offer, whatever it is, memorable, clear, understandable to even to lay people so that when someone hears about a need that one of their friends or colleagues has, they, Oh, you know who you should call? You should call <laughs> ghostbusters. <laughs> you have a Sorry. ghost in your ballroom. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, that movie's so good. Well, I like to think about it in terms of these sort of big categories, and maybe we could start there and then kind of like choose some from different columns. And you've got some great examples that you found, Jonathan. Cool. Yeah, I brought in a few. So, so I mean, to be fair, they're mostly like like students and uh, or people I know. But there's some I have some other ones like people I've interviewed on podcasts and things. Um, but well, the, so the, let's, let, I want to talk about this. So I'm curious if, you, if you'll think of this list the same way that I do, or if you'll add some or subtract some from it. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to think, like, how could we do this almost like a menu, right, mm -hmm. where you pick one from some categories. I don't think you have to pick one from all. Like sometimes you have dinner without an appetizer or without <laughs> dessert. Um, but so I was thinking about, like, some of the different ways we could combine these. And one would be... Um, by business phase or type of company. So it could be like startups, uh, could be, um, you know, Fortune 500 or Inc. growth companies. Um, I know somebody who focuses on Amlaw 50 what? companies. What is that? It, it, it's, it's the top 50 law firms Okay. in America. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, and see, that's an example. Like if you were a lawyer, you would know exactly what that is. And if you're not, you'd go, 
you know, it, right. it just wouldn't even listen, which would be ideal. <laughs> um, and then, you know, professional service firms, consulting firms, or you could do, um, you know, like I do, you could focus on soloists, you could focus on retailers or mom and pop small businesses. So that, that kind of like business phase mm -hmm. would be one. Yep. Yeah. Then, the, the vertical, the psychographic. I mean, we've, we've done episodes before where we categorize like five, I think five different types of specialization. And my experience is that people, maybe, maybe it's, maybe it's just my engineering types, but they get wrapped around the axle about what kind of niching they're doing. And it doesn't matter. Like it, it, it's meant as a framework to help you find a niche perhaps in your existing client base. If you think of like, you might look back at your client base and say like, ah, oh, there's nothing in common. I, I've worked with all different kinds of clients. It's like, well, maybe in a vert from a vertical perspective, maybe, but maybe not in a psychographic or a phase, like you're saying, like maybe they're in some phase. Where yeah. And I didn't, I didn't even add psychographics for this. Cause it, to me, I was looking for like, what's a starting point. Yeah. Cause the psychographics is where you can really have some fun. Um, right. when you're first starting out, you probably are not really sure where you want to go with that. Yeah. Right. But it's, I also it's a lot harder to see. You can look at client title. I mean, I spent a lot of years in a big consulting firm focusing on one client title. I mean, I knew exactly who I wanted to meet, mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't like that title at any business phase. It was, you know, Fortune 500 companies for the most mm -hmm. part. So, you know, you pick one from column A, one from column B, <laughs> right. and then you have a skill set, right, which you can... I mean, there are literally a, a, an infinite number of ways that people could define their skill set. So you could be like a marketing or a content strategist. You could be a brand designer, a developer, uh, a crisis communications expert. I mean, that's right. like where the where the the talents come in, right? From the talent column. Mm -hmm. And then the other one I was playing with a little bit is is by profession, and maybe that's because of what I focus on. But you might go after actuaries or CPAs or engineers or architects, lawyers, consultants. You know, you pick a profession mm -hmm. um, versus a title, or maybe it's both. Maybe it's it's a lawyer, but it's a partner at an AM50 law firm. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, so what I liked about it is that it just gives you a structural framework to work from. And so you can start to think about, hmm, how would I like to get more specific about who I'm targeting? Right, right. So I the ones, the, the target markets that uh, I'm attracted to, I can, it might just be me, but like as they're sort of, as I'm exposed to somebody's target market, I can... I can feel this light switch moment happen going from, yeah, I have, I don't know any, I, like I, I'm not, my brain is not running through my mental Rolodex of people, but then they, they, you know, finish describing. And then at a certain point I'm like, oh, I, I thought of someone, or at least I suddenly there was enough specificity that I could even run through the list. Mm. Cause you can't, I need something to filter down the list. I probably know 10,000 people. I don't know. And so I need something to filter it down. Yeah. And once the, once the filter is, it hits this tipping point where it goes from zero to one, it goes from like, I, you got to give me something. I, I can't even flip through my Rolodex with nothing. And then they get specific enough where I'm like, oh, I just thought of someone. And to me, that's where, that's where you, you might've dialed the, the binoculars into the right level of focus where at least one person had a Rolodex moment about the thing that you said. So. Ooh, you know what's interesting about that, though? I just wanted to add this because I've had this happen with people who who I had preliminary conversations with. If what's happening when you're having not new business conversations, but sort of get to know you conversations is people are not getting that Rolodex moment, mm -hmm. the fault is yours. Yes, totally. <laughs> it's not the other person. It's you haven't narrowed your market to be specific enough that the other person is understanding. Now, obviously, if you have a, if you're an architect and you're talking to somebody, I don't know, is flipping burgers, maybe they don't know anybody that that's in your, your, um, your specialty, but it's rare with yeah. the kinds of conversations we're talking about. Right. And, and, and I would count, I would count it as a Rolodex moment, even if I came up with zero hits, but that, that the, my brain triggered like, Oh, do I know anybody? It's, 
it's like a level yeah. of specificity that's, I mean, hopefully they know someone or, and I would even say that in certain circles, you're going to have a very high hit rate where they do think of one or two people that they could in theory introduce you to. Um, the, the example that blew my mind that was, you know, just a personal example that I just still can't believe was the, have I told you the, the thoroughbred horses story? I don't know if I've oh, told this one on the yeah, show. Yeah, I don't know if we did it on the show though. But just to give it, here's the, here's where I kind of want this episode to go is, is to, to shock people by how, uh, I guess, like how big a small market is, or it's, so it's usually surprisingly large. But so the example that I, that comes to mind was, you know, I was typing up a daily email and I, I, I at, like I voice typed, you know, um, something to the effect of like, how many people are something about thoroughbred horses? I said, how many people own thoroughbred horses in the United States or something like that? And, uh, oh, you know what it was? I probably couldn't spell thoroughbred. So I voice typed it. <laughs> That's probably what it was. And, uh, Erica was sitting next to, me, next to me and she's like, Oh, are you sending an email to Gretchen? And I was like, Gretchen who? She's like, my, my cousin Gretchen. I was like, why? And she's, she has thoroughbred horses. And I was like, she does. And I was, and, and so then I was like, huh. So then I emailed the list and I, I said something about, you know, I'm just curious how many people know someone that owns thoroughbred horses. And I got like 40 or 50 people who replied with a yes. And not just, not just one thoroughbred horse, but I think there was a, more than one person who ran an entire business like managing thoroughbred horses for clients. Mm -hmm. And so like I would have in a million years, I would have never thought that thoroughbred horses was like, uh, you know, there, there's a market, like there's enough people to support a business of some kind, you know, it's, it becomes a different conversation. Like, what would you do for them that there's demand for? But I was just blown away by, I was trying to think of something that was so specific that it would be too small to support a business. And of course it was <laughs> not, <laughs> not that one close. And, and not in England or Ireland, especially I'm sure. Right. Or who knows? I mean, anyway, uh, but that's the, to me, it's like, it's not small. It sounds small, like it must be small, but it's way bigger than you'd ever need, you know, and they're buying stuff. They're buying lots mm -hmm. of stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's an expensive hobby. So there's demand for things. There might not be demand for your thing, but there's demand for some things. Anyway, it was, it was, but I think it's wildly specific. It's very, very specific. It triggered like dozens and dozens of Rolodex moments. Yeah, and I think there's this judgment around the word small. Somehow it just sounds like, oh, it's a small market, but I want to be successful and I want to have something that's, and when I, I'm putting big in quotes, not big, like lots of employees, but you want to have a successful business. And mm -hmm. I think if we can substitute specific for small, mm -hmm. <laughs> it maybe it, it cracks through a psychological barrier yeah. of, to niching. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And let's, and, and let's also paint a picture beyond what might be a first step. Like you, you, I'm just a huge fan of, you know, getting into a very specific market and getting traction, building up a real book of business. Like, so you're like, Oh, I'm not going to say dominate the market, but maybe, maybe, maybe but you just, you get a ton of traction in the market and in, and just to speak to other psychological barriers here, then dominate another one. Like you don't have to sit there forever. <laughs> if you right. want to, you can, if you don't want to, you don't have to, you've got that part sentence. of your business. Yeah. So like if, if you feel like, okay, I've got this dialed, I understand I'm, I'm an insider now. I've got all the lingo. I know how to find these people. I know what their pains, dreams, hopes, and fears are. And and now I'm going to do an adjacent market or now I'm going to do one that, you know, if the original one, if the original target market was podiatrists, then the next one could be chiropractors or, you know what I mean? It's like, you don't have to sit there forever. It's not, it doesn't necessarily limit your long-term growth. It's about getting a fire started and understanding how to serve a particular, a specific group of people and, and just the mind blowing, it's almost a revelation around how much easier everything gets when you understand the group, when the group is specific enough that you can understand them you can speak their language. You can be viewed as an insider. It's just mind blowing the difference. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it feels like magic when it's you. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. So I was I was thinking we could jump over to some examples. Yeah. Okay. Please tell me you're going to start with the pressure washing guy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I I know we probably don't have any pressure washers listening to us, but I, I just I love this example. Yeah. So so I have to be a little bit delicate here, but it's someone I interviewed on Ditching Hourly, um, and you can listen to that episode when it goes live. It's not live yet, but this is essentially a web design guy. You know, he's got he's got a bunch of employees now, um, teams of people now doing, doing web design. And there are probably a lot of people listening who are web designers or small uh, web design firms or shops or agencies. And, and this particular web design guy was in the pressure washing business for a short time, uh, young guy. And, he, and he had, he, he, I don't know if he fell off a roof or something happened and he, uh, he had, he was in the hospital f- with uh neck and back problems for a while. And his, Ooh. of course, his pressure washing business fell apart because he needed to be there. He needed to be climbing around on roofs and stuff. So he had picked up some skills in the, it's just, it's just basic web design skills for his own business. You know, like I'm imagining that he just like got a Wix subscription and like bashed something out. So while he was laid up, he was like, well, maybe I can start doing just, just working on the computer. Maybe I can build websites for other pressure washers. Long story short, you know, five years later, he's adding 30 new customers per month, 30 new customers per month to his pressure washing web design business, (laughs) which is so specific that he's got, this isn't, this happens after, right? Like it's, but over the course of a couple of years, he's got, since he's so specifically focused on these types of businesses and he knows them inside out that he's been able to create tons of systems and boilerplate and stock photography and illustrations and funnels and all of these things that are extremely effective for this extremely specific target market. And it's so powerful. There's so much leverage that he can onboard a customer per day and serve them without, without it being too much work, without it overwhelming a team. So even if he had, Mm -hmm. even if imagine, even if you had 10 people, I don't know how many biggest team is, but he has teams, he said, but Mm -hmm. even if you had 10 people, good luck onboarding a new client a day to build them a website (laughs) across any random industry that you don't know anything about. And you don't know anything more about pressure washing or chiropractors or, you know, pet shelters, or you don't, you know, you're learning every time you're learning all the things about the business. There's nothing really in common, different language, different, different focus, different photos, different colors, everything different. And you you would collapse. You would, I mean, you would never be able to do it. Now, the other thing to think of is that if he's, if he's got a new customer every single day and he's, let's say his close rates 50%, right? Mm -hmm. That means he's getting 60 qualified leads per month and he's closing half. Mm -hmm. So that's like Mm -hmm. six, 700 qualified leads per year. That, (laughs) and, and he mentioned on the show that he doesn't advertise. He doesn't, he's not doing content marketing. It's pure referrals. Oh, yeah. Was, that was going to be my next question. Mm-hmm. Can, yeah. can you talk about his, uh, his business model, how he charges? Yeah. So it's so systematized that he, he, it, he charges $180 a month, no upfront cost. So somebody comes along the pressure washer comes along and says, Hey, I, you know, I saw your little link down. I, maybe this isn't, doesn't count as referral, but I guess it is like he does somebody's website, pressure washing site, some guy that's new to pressure washing or gal that's new to pressure washing sees this competitor site, thinks it looks really good. Oh, look down at the bottom. Oh yeah. A that's link. a referral. I yeah. count that. So they, they set up a call and it's, it's, uh, I mean, the offer basically is it's 180 bucks a month, no upfront cost. We'll have your website up 
in as little as 30 days, depending, depending on the client's responsiveness, they could easily do it in 30 days if they can get the content from the, from the client. But usually it's Mm -hmm. a little bit of a tooth pulling exercise. (laughs) So, but yeah, they can crank out websites that are beautiful, effective lead generation websites for someone in the pressure washing business. And it's, they just, Swipe their credit card. It's one hundred and eighty dollars a month. Uh, they they commit to twenty four months. It's basically a payment plan, not really a subscription, even though the mechanics are the same as a subscription. Mm-hmm. And then at the end of the twenty four months, they're downgraded to I think it's one hundred and fifty dollars a month, and uh, it, you just for, for basically for hosting and updates and you, basically they have paid off the website creation and they'll just continue to pay for the maintenance. And he does uh, he does a his promise is that you would just never have to worry about your website, you know? And, right? It makes me wish I had a pressure washing business just so right. I could feel that. <laughs> right. So, and, and, and 180 a month is his minimum. He said, he said, I think, I think he said 95% of people, I can't remember the percentage, but it was significant. It was more than half pick the $250 option. And he's been, you know, he's been adding a customer a day for years. So do the math. Yeah. You know, this guy's doing well into the seven figures as a web design firm specializing on pressure washing service businesses. Well, and there's something else I want to point out here. I know this is a niching episode, but this is what's so interesting to me is it's really tempting. And I'm going to use website design as the example, since that's what this gentleman is doing. It's really simple to say, oh, yes, I want to do high end bespoke websites and I'm, I want to charge, you know, 50 or a hundred or 200, whatever the, you know, whatever the magic number is for your, your segment of the population. And then you look at this where he said, I'm going to focus on this business. You don't think about, at least I don't, I don't know anything about the pressure washing business, but I imagine it's not full of people who are going, Oh, my website has to be perfect. And the images have to be just so what they want is they want to get leads from it. That's what they care about. And they want it to work. And so offering this upfront, you know, I'm going to call it a subscription model just because it feels like it. Yeah, it does. Um, but this this idea, it allows him to create an ongoing business where he's able to hire employees. He's obviously has to be really dialed into these systems. I mean, you can't do this level of business and not have that or you're, you know, you won't do that level of business for long. And obviously right. he's been doing it a while. So I think, you know, the, I guess what I'm saying is we don't have to just look at kind of the very high end bespoke piece, we can also look at the other end where there are people who have real serious needs and there's a way that you can create a system, you know, basically a a product or a service or a productized service that meets that and you make up for what you lose on price in volume. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's genius. I love it. Yeah. I love it too. And, and, and to our, our sort of, earlier discussion around it not being a life sentence like oh i get bored just doing pressure washing so that was where he got his start that is the still the bulk of his business but he started broadening out into other local service businesses Mm -hmm. so he's got uh you know just whatever plumbers he should try plumbers oh my goodness i just was looking for a plumber and they are the worst websites (laughs) ever ever Yeah. Yeah. So he's extended into like cleaning services, other kinds of cleaning services, Mm -hmm. lawn care, driveway, uh, you know, you get the idea stuff, services that are centered around somebody's house. And, you know, so he's, I mean, he'll never capture all of all of those markets. He could just keep going. Right. So it's not like it's, it's really a, I feel like it's a, a phase thing where at the beginning to get traction, to establish really solid, predictable cash flow, a great approach is to pick a very specific market that ideally that you know inside out and serve some existing demand. And then you can expand over time, which is why a, a lot of times I'll get, people will be like, oh, well, ID, they'll come pick some example of a company that's been around for 40 years and they'll say, well, they're not. They're not niche. I'm like, they're not niche now. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I'll bet they were 40 years ago. Yeah. You know, that's like. Exactly. Right. You don't start big. Right. Yeah. 
You start so, specific. Yeah, specific. It's just, it's just, it just makes everything easier. Are there exceptions? Of course, there's tons of exceptions. Like people who just left their corporate job, they're like, they've got a t big network of people who need what they do and they just keep getting referrals from all over the map. Yeah, it happens. It does happen. But if you're not getting lots of referrals, you're not getting leads, you're not happy with your cash flow, this is a very powerful, proven approach. Sometimes it doesn't work, but it's it's playing on when easy it works, mode, in my it's, opinion. It's a thing of beauty. It is a thing of beauty. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I just love this example because power washers, to me, sounds like such a small market, but it's just completely big enough, you know? Yeah. Well, it's it's when you know a market, then you can decide if it's if it's big enough for you. But mm -hmm. a lot of us, there's a lot of stuff we don't know. Like I would never have guessed that there's that big of a market for for power washers. <laughs> the thoroughbreds I might have guessed, but I wouldn't know because it's not my thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, now I know it's way more of a thing that the the, the horses thing. Like I, I probably would have naively guessed there were a thousand, you know, owners. Like how many race horses could there be? You know, like. Uh, I don't know, just completely, completely wrong. Like by how, orders how of magnitude. How many are there? I don't know. How many what? are there? I, I, you know, I, I was don't just know, curious because that's not a, I mean, I don't know if I would have said like a hundred thousand, I wouldn't have guessed that. I'd guess much lower too. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so. <laughs> I do know that the people who do it spend a lot, a lot, a lot of money. Right. A lot, a lot of buying power there. Yes. Yes. Uh, cool. So. Do you want to move on to a different example? Yeah, although I really love this one. I'm glad we glad we talked about this. Yeah, and, and it's and it's inter. It, I guess the I guess a point about the business model is worth emphasizing, which is like the the business model of the 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 pressure washing websites guy. Sort of a subs it's it's not sort of it is a basically it's a subscription model. That's not necessarily you know, that's what worked for his people. It might not work for other people. There could be a market that wants their websites paid for in a different way. Who knows? But it's, I think it's interesting as we move to another example, maybe we'll jump over to our mutual friend, Geraldine Carter. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I just want to hit one last thing about that point. It's that when he first started doing this, I'll bet that took some courage and some some kind of thinking through, wait a minute, to actually create this website is really going to be, you know, $3,000, but I'm only going to take 150. Ooh, what if they don't pay? You know what I mean? You can kind of go oh, through yeah. that, that cycle. And at some point you just say, I'm going to try it. I'm going to, I'm going to experiment with it. So that's why I like this example so much. There are so many points on this spectrum that you can choose. And the key is to, to have it match you know, your talents, passions, and the market, and then create a business model around it. Like if you didn't want lots of employees, this wouldn't be a model that would work for you. Right. But if you're really good at systems and you can manage this thing, this could be the perfect business. Yeah. And we, and we talked about, if someone's curious, we, we talked about all of that stuff. Like what about scope creep? What about endless revisions? How much, how much time did it take to build the systems that, cause he has tons of automation, tons of systems, how much, you know, mm -hmm. where does he draw the line around what's in scope? What's out of scope? We went into all of that stuff. Uh, but yeah, when you have six figures a month of cash flow, it's a lot of wiggle room. <laughs> you have some options. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, let's see here. Okay. So, you so talk about Geraldine. Yes. So Geraldine Carter, I call her the CPA, the savior, CPA savior, but that's not what she calls herself. Um, so she helps overworked CPAs who want to get down to 40 hours a week without giving up revenue. So, so for her specific market, I would call this not that the labels matter, but for those following along at home, I would call this a combination of a vertical, a uh, psychographic, and in a second, I'm going to tell you also a demographic. So it's just, it's like to pick from your list that you were talking about before. You can pick these mm -hmm. three little ingredients. And uh, these particular types of CPAs, they're not trying to grow their firm. They're not trying to make more money. They've got, the, the, that's not their problem. Their problem is they're working every weekend. So when she 
speaks to them, whether it's in, in her marketing or on her mailing list or you know, like on her website, her mailing list or podcast in her products, in her courses, she's not, she doesn't want to talk about that. We're going to double your revenue as a first step. Like maybe that'll happen. Maybe that's a second step, but the first step is to get your Saturdays back without mm-hmm. losing money. And they just don't know how to get there. Right. Yeah. So she's specific speaking to a very specific, um, desire. It's a very specific desire. And, and a very and, deeply felt emotional one too. Oh yeah. I mean, you're, yeah. you're basically picking your business over your family. Right. And it's, and it's no surprise that lots of her, uh, clients have children. It's like, it's mm-hmm. not a surprise at all. Yeah. Makes sense. Mm-hmm. So then she gets even more specific. So CPAs is an obvious vertical. That's vertical specialization. It's like you can go to somebody's LinkedIn and it says right there, I'm a CPA, right? So, um, but these are, but more than, more than just being a CPA, cause you could be an in-house accountant. These are people who run their own firm. They don't have partners. They probably got a small team and they're doing, you know, between 100 and 600 K in revenue roughly. So that's where the demographic stuff starts to come in. So they are in a particular kind of CPA firm. And this is for the owner, like the, the, whatever you call the owner of a CPA firm. I don't know if it's not partners cause it's, it's not for partners, but partners. Yeah. Yeah. So that is really specific and guess what it does. It gives me a Rolodex moment, mm-hmm. right? I don't, and I don't just think of all the CPAs I know. I think of the ones that seem like they're overworked, the ones that have kids, the ones that maybe, uh, you know, I can remember them complaining on tax Twitter about the, you know, the tax season. I mean, we're actually, ironically enough, we're recording uh, on tax day today. Yeah, it's funny. Yeah. So this is highly specific. And I'll bet you, if you could Google for this exact list of criteria, you probably get 100,000, 10,000. I don't know, a million. I don't oh, know what the numbers gotta are. Be. Yeah. And if you're focusing, let's assume she's focusing in the U.S., I mean, there are hundreds of thousands of CPAs. So the question is how many independent CPAs are there that are in this psychographic? And yeah, it's got to be at least 10,000. I would think more. Mm -hmm. I I just think pretty much every accountant I've ever met in the, in the pitching process seems to like be crazy at tax time. (laughs) Well, (laughs) not all CPAs do tax. So that's. That's yeah. one thing, but they, but yeah. her people probably do because, and that's probably why they're going crazy. Yeah. So you could probably search for, um, there's, I'm sure there's, well, but, I mean, we've done this exercise. Yeah. Yeah. There, and, you and can Geraldine's find plenty of site would probably pop up. So <laughs> yeah. 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 And if you're a CPA an independent CPA listening to this, you should follow her, listen to her podcast. I mean, she's amazing. Yep. And, and she knows because she because she is focused on CPAs in this particular situation, she can speak with like comical specificity around the things that are going through their mind because yeah. it's 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 in common. There's so many things in common. So the language on her website just explodes off the page because it's like it's like she's rooting around in your subconscious, <laughs> like pulling <laughs> stuff out. Like she's like pulling stuff out of your subconscious attic and being like, do you really need, do you really, is this good? Like, or do you want to get rid of this? <laughs> so it's just the, the, the effectiveness just goes way up, you know, because it's like if, because she can describe the problem better than they can. And when you can do that, it makes the listener assume, or at least confident that you've got a solution to this because you obviously know the problem so well, we just met and you were reading my mind that, that tells me that you probably know what I should do next. Like you've, this is not your first rodeo is what it tells you. Yeah. Yeah. It's like when you meet like somebody who winds up being your best friend or one of your inner circle and you first meet them and like, you just keep listening and talking to each other and connecting because you get each other. Mm -hmm. That's the equivalent on a larger scale. Mm-hmm. And interestingly enough, and different from our previous example, she's not a CPA. Which right? I just love because CPAs are the toughest market to crack. <laughs> I mean, CPAs want to be spoken to by other CPAs, but Geraldine proved that's not necessarily true. Exactly. You can get through it. Mm-hmm. Um, so cool stuff there. It's a uh, business model. 
business model, not subscription. Different, more of a, her, her main thing right now, and I'm, I'm sure I'm not speaking out of school because this is loud and clear on her homepage, uh, is that she has a, a mastermind that, I mean, you, you could go and check it out at GeraldineCarter.com. It's like she has this mastermind that is sort of cohort based. It's like a, a in-depth workshop plus coaching. And it's very, it's very effective in-depth mindset, everything where she, she's so sure of the people that she's bringing in. She's so sure of the type of person that it is and the situation they're in that she can guarantee results because she knows exactly how to, how to, uh, I don't want to say press the buttons, but she just, she just knows all the objections, where all the fears are going to come from, how to overcome them, what, you know, she has like coaches in there, like mindset coaches in there that can help you with like your, you know, limiting beliefs. I mean, it's like very, it's very in depth and she couldn't have, I, I would argue she could not have created such a specific, powerful, effective product. I mean, the testimonies on our website are ridiculous. Like she could not have, have po uh, created such a thing without being this focused down on a particular target market, a specific, very specific target market. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's how you get into people's heads and you can speak to them. Right. Yeah. yeah. And deliver results. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, there's, yeah, there's the two pieces. It's, it's you speak to them so they understand that you get them and you specialize in people just like them. And then you know, then the other, the other end of that is this is the transformation. Here are the stories of other people who've gotten that transformation. And then that's when I presumably then they have a conversation and then you, you deliver the goods. <laughs> yeah. It increases your ability to make the transformation that they want. Yeah. 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 Right. And, uh, it's not boring. Like that's a, a common objection is like, Oh, I'll be bored. It's like, uh, transforming people's lives is never boring. It's no, it's the best. No. Or as one of our podcast guests who would not allow us to attribute this to them <laughs> said, you, you know, what's not, not boring? boring, getting, getting rich. rich. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to, I was going to try and do that in stereo, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Obviously cool. we both remembered that one. Yes. So I've got, I mean, I probably have five more examples here. I, um, Another, another one, one of, one of my, uh, this is past student, um, Corey Quinn. I actually have is weirdly enough. I have two students named Corey Quinn, uh, <laughs> but this particular Corey Quinn went to, went on to partner with another fellow and create the duck bill group. And, but when Corey first started, he just dubbed himself a cloud economist and his, his claim was that he would save you from your hideously uh, expanding AWS bill. Mm -hmm. yeah. So like all, so this is, is in a sense, this is a horizontal, well, it's really a platform specialty, but it's hyper sp specific on uh, AWS cost controls. And he started very quickly. He started attracting clients who were spending six figures a month on AWS. So this is, this is an example of, you know, but they're all different kinds of companies. I guess it's probably all SaaS related. I don't actually know, but he doesn't talk about, he doesn't talk about a specific target market. He speaks to a specific problem or pain that someone's having. So maybe this is the, maybe this is the sort of exception that proves the rule, but I don't think so. I don't think so because People who are spending tons of his target market is people who are spending six figures a month on AWS. That's not a vertical. Maybe it's a demographic. I don't know. I don't know what you would call that, but well, it is. It's they, an they elite self, group. They self-identify, mm -hmm. right? You know, if you're in the club, right? Yeah, right. So again, maybe maybe it's the exception that proves the rule. It's it's a specific. It's specific enough for for me to have a Rolodex moment. So so it's not an exception. Yeah. Do you know yeah. anybody that's spending six figures a month on AWS? That makes me go through my mind. Like, is Nate spending that much? No. What about David? Maybe I'll ask David. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, yeah, I it's guess it's very it is. specific. Yeah, it's very specific. Um, but it doesn't have any of the, it doesn't have any of the, it doesn't have any of what I would call the normal 
um, factors sort mm -hmm. of like it's one thing about it that I, that, uh, I think is, it's, it's not proven to be a weakness. It seems they, they're doing great, but, uh, the, the thing about it is you can't tell, like, I can't tell from the outside how much someone else is spending on AWS. Right. So yeah. I, it's not how do you obvious. Find them? Yeah. How do you find them? Like, where's that, where do you, where's that list of people? And it's probably not, I mean, it's certainly, it's, it's definitely people who use AWS, which you can detect. And there probably, there are services that are only of interest to people who are of a certain size. So there might be ways that, that you could, you know, figure out like, oh, this person is using, um, an EC2 instance that it's like so massive that they must be, you know, they must be spending tons of money per month or they, they must have a yeah. billion transactions a day, uh, going through some like wacky database solution that, that must be costing them a fortune. So I think you could reverse engineer this, but his approach was just to like, uh, talk about this hyper specific skill that he had. And then it automatically attracted a very, very specific clientele. Yeah, so, I think with something like that, there, there are probably proxies to get to, um, understanding who is in your market. Exactly. And, and there, yeah. And there's some other firms that, that, get in this kind of quandary as well, because there's a certain kind of type that they, that they serve, that it's just their ideal client and they have amazing transformations and amazing stories, but it's a little harder to slice and dice them. Right. Yeah. I mean, he could just go to Crunchbase and say like, you know, what are the, what are the top 50, you know, uh, most popular SaaS companies like Slack's definitely spending, you know, as, assuming they're using AWS, they're definitely spending it's six figures per month on it. Twitter, if they're using AWS is definitely spending six figures a month. Right. So like it mm -hmm. would be really easy to guess anyway, but he, he, yeah. didn't, he, he didn't need to be that. He, he just went pure content marketing and, and the, the people came running. So an example of picking a very expensive problem, literally expensive problem. <laughs> <laughs> literally. Yeah. I kind of six figure cost a problem. Yeah. So let me, uh, and then we got to wrap up soon. So let, let me just give you, maybe we can link to these things in the show notes, but, um, uh, my friend, Kurt Elster has a web design shop, but he doesn't present himself that way. He is a, uh, Shopify plus consultant who, as he puts it, will turn your Shopify store into a rever revenue generating powerhouse of persuasion. <laughs> he's, a, he's a character. Oh, that's good. I like that. Right. And he, you know, just the Shopify plus people are spending tons of money to be on Shopify plus. So they're automatically have a lot of buying power and he just focuses on them. Very easy to find them. Very easy to know if you know someone who's selling on Shopify and on his homepage, he gets very specific about, um, he, he will be a good fit if, and then he lists five things that are very specific. Mm -hmm. uh, another one is uh, Kevin Wellen. He has a sort of uh, digital marketing for co-working spaces where he his promise to them is that he can get them book solid. So like people who run co-working spaces, they've got a lot of overhead and they need to be at 85% or higher capacity to make a profit in most cases. So he has different programs for, for co-working spaces. He's got a couple of segments inside of co-working spaces, which are things like, you know, if you're multi-location or not, if you're a single location, but wants to expand into multi-location and like different stages or sizes of co-working space situation. Uh, so that's very specific. Um, there's a couple of more mutual friends. Emily O'Meara is, does positioning for open source projects like boom. startups. You, yeah. Right. Open source startups. Right. So yeah, based on that sort of thing. So based on open source software, uh, Erica Goody, who we've, we've been on her show. Has she been on our show too? I can't remember. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So it's CFO services for coaches and consultants. Know any coaches? Know any consultants? <laughs> do they, do they have money? <laughs> do they need CFO well, services? Yeah. And I was laughing because, you know, her clientele dovetails with, with mine. And I was in a meeting with a client and they needed somebody. And I said, Oh, you should talk to. 
Right. <laughs> yeah. It's and you have those Rolodex moments not just when they're talking to you, but when they're not there. Uh-huh. That's when it's really magic. Right. Yeah, so we could go on and on. Jim McDonald does uh uh, podiatrygrowth.com stand out grow your podiatry practice former podiatrist so he or i guess current i don't know if he's a practicing podiatrist but he he's an md that uh has more fun growing other people's businesses so mm-hmm. he is focused down on podiatry practices man say that 10 times fast <laughs> uh, but you know we could probably come up with a dozen more examples uh, there's some hilarious ones that people send to me from time to time one that came to mind was uh, a landscape painter named James Nye. I don't know how to say his name. N I E H U E S Nyhues, maybe. And uh, he's a landscape painter, but he specially he, he I guess got his start or claim to fame was uh, painting maps for ski resorts. So his target market were people who run his ideal buyer, is someone who runs a ski resort and needs a map. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, he he. He was dubbed the Michelangelo of snow and, and has since moved into B2C stuff where he, he sells, um, books and prints and you can filter by your state and he just paints s- ski trails all day long <laughs> mm. <laughs> of all the things you yeah. could paint, all the things you could specialize down on. Uh, but yeah, but his, his main client, at least at one point was, uh, ski resorts cool. and like how many of them could there be? A hundred, a thousand, a hundred thousand. I mean, a hundred thousand in the world. I don't know. Oh, the world of oh, the world. Okay. Yeah. The world is different. Yes. The world is different. So on his website, it says filter by country, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, United States. Oh, he doesn't have all the European ski. Oh I, man. I he's missing know. a market. I get me. He's, maybe he's yeah. booked up. I don't know. The French and Italian Alps, Swiss Alps. Forget yeah. about it. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, I mean they're 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 we'll put some links. We'll put some links yeah. in the in the show notes so you can right. refer to these at your leisure. Yeah, but to just to bring it back to the beginning, the the emphasis really is about being specific, not small, like small as a necessity. It's just smaller than everyone or businesses or even small businesses. Like these examples are are all way smaller than that pressure washers podiatrists shopify plus customers they're all smaller than everybody the planet's population but they're not small they're They're certainly not too small to support exactly yeah cool anything else before we wrap it up no i just think we focus on being specific yeah my new favorite word like (laughs) like should is my non-favorite word yes well, it would be hilarious, folks, if you stumble across a highly specific positioning, specifically around a niche market, send it our way. You know how to find us. Just shoot us an email and we can maybe do a follow up on just like a maybe that would be a good uh, uh, holiday break episode. Just, <laughs> <laughs> just like a, a rundown laundry list of very specific niche markets. Cool. Cool. All right, folks, that's it for this week. I'm Jonathan Stark. And I'm Rochelle Moulton. And we hope you join us again next time for the Business of Authority. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.